Good morning. Welcome to day three or four for most of us here of the Global Conference. Thank you for joining us for this really important dialogue we're going to have about one of the greatest challenges facing us today, Alzheimer's disease. My name is Cecilia Aradaza. I'm the Director of Communications and Policy for Faster Cures, a center of the Milken Institute that's really focused on how best to improve the medical research system to accelerate the time it takes to get a new medicine from discovery to the patient's bedside. Today, I am privileged to introduce a phenomenal panel of experts in science, medicine, health, technology, policy, and yes, even foreign diplomacy to really talk about and address exactly how large a problem we are facing, the urgency that we have to face it with, and hopefully leave this conversation today with a couple of to-dos, because each one of us, as we all know, is not exempt from this unfortunate, unfortunate toll that, that Alzheimer's brings. So let me start by providing a landscape and setting the context for this conversation. Slide two, please. So Alzheimer's disease, the most common form of dementia, affects someone in America every 68 seconds. One in nine Americans aged 65 and older will develop Alzheimer's disease or has it. One in three ages 85 and older. Two thirds of seniors with Alzheimer's disease are women. And those are just the people impacted by Alzheimer's. We know only too well the undue burden it places on caregivers, on communities, on families, on businesses, on countries. And so as we talk about the numbers, I wanted to you know, take a, a quick step back and really ground this conversation on what each of the numbers mean. And I'm here today not just as part of Faster Cures, not just as part of the Milken Institute and an advocate for, for Alzheimer's, but I wanna, I'm here because it has impacted me personally and I wanted to ground this conversation with that. So I want to introduce you, allow me to introduce you to the, the smartest man I know. My father, engineer Cecilio Obejero. Pay, um, let me just pull up slide number five, please. His words were my true north. He was an engineer. He lived his life with precision, growing up as the youngest of six kids the adage that you cut twice, I mean, you measure twice and cut once did not apply in my household. It was much more like you measure 20 times and if you decided to cut, you better cut with the sharpest blade you know. <laughs> so 10 years ago, I got a call from my mother, frantic, because the Fairfax County Police brought my father to the ER. Now I'm like, so exactly what made that happen? Well, apparently he was driving twice the speed limit on the other side of the highway mm. because he was on his way to California from Virginia and people were waiting for him as he was going to a meeting. So just imagine that moment of, it was almost like all of the many moments of memories lost or forgetfulness crescendoed to that moment of him driving on the other side. Thank goodness no one was hurt. You know, that's just a matter of luck at this point. And so from that moment on, there was no turning back. Our family, has cha our family dynamics changed. My mother had to really step it up in ways she never imagined she would. They've been married 57 years at that point, and she was in it for the long haul. But the next 10 years were grueling. They were painful. This proud, dignified, precise man lost not just his memory, not just his ability to recognize the most dear people in his life, he lost the most basic of physical abilities. And it struck me at one point when I was at about six years ago when I had a, a newborn at that point, when I was at Costco standing in line buying diapers for my newborn and my father. And it just struck me just how painful this disease is. And it's not just him, it's not just our family, the ripple effects keep going. So I don't mean to be such a downer so early in the morning, but that's what we're faced with today. And I'm going to start with Bob Hormatz. Let me start with Bob, who is the Undersecretary for Economic Growth, Energy, and Environment for the U.S. Department of State. 
Bob was also former vice chairman of Goldman Sachs. Bob, give us some context here. My story multiplied by 36 million times. That's just in the U.S. Multiply that globally. What are we looking at here? Well, first of all, thank you very much, and it's really a pleasure to be here. When George called me about this, I was very eager to join the conversation. Uh, even though I'm not uh, an expert in Alzheimer's, as my co-panelists are, I have spent a great deal of time looking at the domestic and the international consequences of aging in general, and particularly uh, concerns about Alzheimer's and other kinds of dementia because the way I tend to look at this um, is you can either look at this through a paradigm of pessimism or a paradigm of hope um, and let me talk about the the latter first it's very easy when you talk about aging to look at it as a huge burden on the United States Social Security Medicare, uh, people who uh, contract various types of diseases. Um, in fact, it, though it's not an, only an American problem, that is 80% of the non, 80 of the non infectious diseases in the world occur not in the United States or the developed countries, but in the developing countries. So this has become a huge problem in developing countries as well. Uh, so the question is, how do we look at this? And I'll just take one minute to try to put this in context. Countries that are able to find cures to these diseases to enable their elderly to be productive citizens longer, to remain in the workforce longer, to remain active uh, in uh, social affairs longer, to be engaged in society longer, those people themselves are going to have richer lives. But their societies will also be uh, enhanced because they will be able to contribute to their overall economies or overall societies to a far greater degree than if they're in the hospital or they're being cared for by their children or grandchildren. It changes the whole paradigm for a country and it changes the paradigm for the world as these numbers that we see in the United States are replicated in China and India and elsewhere. So this is a profound global problem that will affect the world economy, world politics, and society all around the world. If we, and, and therefore, the, the effort to find a cure is extremely important to the individuals and the families, but to the extent that this can be done, it changes dramatically the opportunities for the United States to use a very talented group of people who otherwise would be taken out of society and out of the workforce by this horrible disease to enable them to be more productive longer, not just economically but socially, and does the same thing for other countries. So what we're talking about here is, I think, one of the <coughs> biggest global challenges we face. Obviously, we've talked a lot in these meetings about uh, the, the question of global warming, environmental issues. That's a huge global challenge. But this is also a global challenge of growing magnitude, of growing significance, if we can address it and address it satisfactorily, it will have changes for our society, making us a more prosperous and productive one, but for many other countries in the world. So this is a global challenge that we in the United States can do a lot about at home, but we also need to collaborate with other countries who are trying to, to, to address this and putting minds together across the world to deal with this because it is a global problem and everyone will gain from uh, finding cures for this and if we don't, everyone is going to lose. Thank you, Bob. So, Sue, actually, let me talk to Anne for a minute here. Anne Whitaker, president of North America Pharmaceuticals Sanofi. Now, Anne, it is, as, as Bob had just said, it is a global challenge. How close are we to actually chipping away at this challenge and ultimately addressing it head on? Yeah, well, well, Bob's absolutely right. It is a global challenge. And I, I would uh, maybe take it from the positive side, like Bob did around the opportunity first. The good news is that um, both pharmaceutical companies, the government, academia, are all really making great effort to do research with Alzheimer's disease. Um, in the past, since 1998, there have been 100 and 103, uh, 104 medicines that have been sort of pursued 
for the treatment of Alzheimer's. Most of those pursued for the treatment of symptoms. However, the bad news is that of those 104, only three products have actually made it into patients and been approved. So the batting average there, the odds are not very good for uh, the research going on here. And the, and, the, and the challenge with Alzheimer's disease research is that we, we don't have a good biomarker. We don't have surrogate markers for the study. So you really are shooting a bit in the dark. Unlike um, research going on for diabetes or cardiovascular disease, where diabetes you can measure HbA1c or blood glucose. With cardiovascular disease, you have LDL. With cancer, you have tumor markers. With Alzheimer's, this is a disease that it sneaks up on you, and, uh, and it's almost too late for really preventing the disease, certainly, and, and sometimes too late for stopping the progression before you know it. I mean, it's, it's a disease that first impacts people's memory, so you start to have more of those senior moments, as, as we call them. You starts to impact your speech, you forget your words. Then it starts to impact your, your thinking, as your father was confused. Um, uh, my father has Alzheimer's too, and this is a uh, you know, personal passion for me. But then it moves on to impacting things like swallowing. You know, I remember when uh, my grandmother also suffered from, from Alzheimer's, and I remember going to her, uh, her assisted living facility and having lunch with her and having to remind her to, to swallow. So we really need to do that work to determine the biomarkers, the surrogate markers for the studies uh, to really uh, progress because um, not only is this, I mean, it's a, it's a devastating disease, but it's a disease that you know, people fear. I mean, what's worse than losing your mind? So when you, when you do surveys of um, elderly people, and I would, I would go as far as say if you did surveys of people my age and perhaps those that have family members um, that have Alzheimer's disease, uh, watch their loved ones go through this. You know, I f fear this, and this is what the surveys show, more than cancer, more than having a stroke, because I can't imagine you know, anything you know, worse than, than losing your mind. Um, and I, I just want to I'll share just a brief story with you about my, my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, um, I don't have pictures of her. If you've had a picture of her like you have your father, she was, you would see a very feisty woman who had grown up, raised five boys, beaten all odds. She had her first job when she was 14 and uh, just a really feisty woman. And uh, when I was uh, a sales representative, I used to go every month and take my grandmother to, to lunch. And uh, she really looked forward to it. She would doll up in Athens, Alabama. We went to the only restaurant, you know, that had sort of white linen tablecloths. And I remember the last time that I went to pick my grandmother up to take her, uh, she, I went to the door, she answered the door. She had every skirt on that she owned. And she had every piece of jewelry that she owned on her person. She had the, a huge pocketbook where she had been hoarding her money and she had all the money that she had as cash with her because she was convinced that the nurses and the residents were, were there to steal her belongings. And uh, I, it took me and all the staff at the facility to, to get her contained in her room, to get her to understand that we, people weren't. They had to sedate her. I watched them strap her down on the, the bed to try to to uh, contain her, and that was the last time my grandmother ever went out for, for lunch. So I just, I, I tell you that story to say, I mean, it's, it's certainly devastating for um, this disease for the person that's going through it, the patient, the individual, but on the family members. I have that memory, and, and, and for me, it's, uh, you know, fear. So we have to be able to address this disease earlier, and that's what we're committed to, certainly at Santa Fe, and, and really doing the basic research to understand this disease so that we can prevent it, so that we can delay the progression before people start to have these uh, symptoms that impacts them from, from being able to contribute to society. Um, you may have heard a quote from uh, our CEO, Chris V. Bacher, saying that you know, we weren't going to invest in large clinical trials until we understood the basic research here. So 
that's Sanofi's position. Other companies are, are, uh, don't have that position. They're taking more of a shots on gold and, and pursuing like, the beta amyloid you know, treatments, the tau uh, protein treatment, insulin resistance. Um, but my just you know, point here, and you hear me say this over and over again, is we have to understand the basic science here. And I'm so pleased to see Francis Collins here with us today and the work that's going on at NIH uh, to really map the brain because that's how we're going to make progress. But to just give people hope, there's a lot of research going on, and George could speak to this as well. There's over 93 compounds that are in research. And what we are trying to do is to try to find, understand the basic science so that we can even put those bar biomarkers or surrogate markers into studies that are currently going on. Thank you very much. And we will definitely talk about the BRAIN initiative and some of these programs that are keys to, to really understanding and unlocking the mysteries of this disease. So, Sue, let me turn to you. Sue Siegel is CEO of Healthy Imagination at GE. And as we heard from, from Anne here, the cost for Alzheimer's is really still essentially unknown. I know at GE you're working on a lot of diagnostic measures and tools to really help us identify this and, and, and piece the different puzzles together, puzzle pieces together. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Sure. Um, Anne actually really framed it well, which is until you under the, actually understand the basics of science, the mechanism of action, how it's all put together, how can you try to, in fact, engender the solution? But when you think about where we are with the brain, essentially it's very similar to where we were in cancer in the 60s. And no one has declared a war on the brain and brain health, if you'd like, until very, very recently with the recent announcement of the brain activity map, which I'm just delighted that, in fact, the country has said, and Francis yet again is going to go and, and charge forward to make this all happen as it relates to really understanding the anatomy of the brain. The way Alzheimer's has been studied is post-death, um, right? Histopathology. And you can't really take a brain tissue when you're alive. Um, not yet, anyway. And so we have to be able to find ways. And when you think about GE, GE has an $18 billion healthcare business. And it was built off of the imaging technologies that exist within GE. And we are doing a very, very systematic approach to brain health. And we are looking at many different diseases, Alzheimer's being one of the most important ones. But in addition to that, we're looking at TBI. We're also looking at um, Parkinson's and a number of other neurodegenerative diseases because we fundamentally believe that, in fact, a lot of the mechanisms of actions around these will end up being fairly um, in the same pathways, if you'd like. And so and I suspect through the databases and I suspect through the information and the data that we'll be able to gather, we will find this out over time. So GE is now spending time not only in imaging technologies, be it better imaging, such as um, our PET scanners, for example, using certain tracers and contrast agents, in addition to looking at EEGs and sensor technologies to understand baselines and also be able to understand the differentials, a number of things around intracranial pressure and tools that we're looking at to be able to study this. We believe that you've got to get earlier and earlier, and many of you already know this, in fact, it has been shown that a lot of people actually have Alzheimer's 15 and sometimes 20 years before it's ever diagnosed. And so if we believe if we can bring these diagnostics tools earlier into the marketplace, really start to systematically with the right sensitivity be able to show that in fact it is, then we can help prevent it. We can help turn, in fact, our populations, our aging population into the productive one that was spoken about so eloquently. And we fundamentally believe that, in fact, we're going to be able to come up with some of the therapeutic solutions and, frankly, some of the preventative behaviors and actions that we have yet to really put into place around Alzheimer's. Thank you very much. So it seems like the more we know, the closer we can really get to meaningful answers. So I'm going to turn this over to you, Neil. <laughs> Neil DiCrescenzo is Senior Vice President and General Manager of Health Sciences at Oracle. So Neil, what's the power of data to help us get towards solutions? Thanks, Cecilia, and also I'd like to <clears throat> add my thanks to George for the opportunity to participate on this really critical issue. 
I think one of the things that you hear a lot about in the IT industry today, and probably many of you are familiar with this current buzzword around big data, and when you think about the work that Ann's talked about, both in the preclinical sphere as well as in clinical development, or what we're going to see from diagnostics and other mechanisms for understanding the early uh, stages of Alzheimer's, this is going to be a tremendous data tsunami that is going to need to be handled effectively by people all across the ecosystem from research to development to caregiving to policy making and, and to payment for health care as well. Uh, this, when people talk about big data, they also always think about it as volume. How much data are we going to have? You know, in reality, while there are large data sets out there, obviously omics, imaging, et cetera, you know, the ability to use compression technology, the ability to keep that raw data in the cloud and just provide the interpreted data to the clinician or others who need to use it, mean that that's not actually the big issue around the data management challenge that we will have across areas, including looking at opportunities to improve the care around Alzheimer's. It's going to really be around not volume, but variety and velocity. It's going to be the number of devices that are actually connected to the Internet that are helping people monitor their brain health and understanding how to deal with any early onset of Alzheimer's and the treatment of people, including obviously the work that caregivers, as we've heard here, do for their family members around Alzheimer's. You know, Cisco has said there's about eight or 10 billion devices today connected to the internet. Now, I always have to put a little bit of grain of salt. I'm sure you all know Cisco makes networking equipment, so <laughs> they round up, they don't round down. <laughs> But uh, we actually believe them, and I think you know, their estimate is by 2020 there will be 40 billion devices connected to the Internet. This is the kind of data management problem that will be impacting healthcare and, of course, many other industries to a substantial extent. And when you think about all that data, it's not only the variety of the data types, but it's also going to be the velocity. There's a huge difference between continuous monitoring and periodic monitoring. And of course, it's nothing like somebody just visiting their doctor once a week and the data going into an electronic health record. So we're talking about a data environment that's going to be very different in the years ahead, really because of societal change, the reduced cost of sensors, the ability to effectively manage this data well beyond the area of Alzheimer's, but has tremendous potential to impact Alzheimer's as well. Fortunately, we have a lot of organizations trying to look at how to do this more effectively. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the probably most important initiatives, and again, I will point to Francis Collins as well as the leader in this, is PCORI's announcement last week, including an article that Francis was a co-author in the uh, Science and Translational Medicine Journal last week about the PCORI's National Patient-Centered Clinical Research Network. So this is an effort that uh, PCORI is dedicating a patient-centered Outcomes Research Institute, $68 million to over the next 18 months. It's going to be very patient-focused, as well as allowing caregivers to take this funding and understand how to get insights as to what's happening and what's often called, even in the pharmaceutical industry, real-world data as to what's happening out there. Uh, this kind of initiative by the government, supported by PCORI and the leadership of Francis and others who've been so instrumental in architecting how we can do better in this arena, will allow us to get the kind of data liquidity that we typically expect in the financial services arena, in the retail arena, in the media markets, really now coming to healthcare. And we think the, the opportunities around that kind of data liquidity will inform the research that Ann and other companies are doing into the basic science, the ability to use the kind of diagnostics and imaging that GE uses, and do it in a way that really brings those advances to patients, their families, and caregivers faster than otherwise would be possible. And just to take a quick step back, Neil, so can you tell the audience here what PCORI is and why it was created really quickly, please? Sure. Uh, you know, PCORI was uh, formed a few years ago as really a way to have a comprehensive and multi-stakeholder oriented organization to understand how to invest in the science, the capabilities, and the infrastructure that's needed for patient-centered outcomes research. I think all four of those words, I'll leave off Institute, are particularly important. I mean, patient-centered, we all know that the healthcare system historically, to some degree, has been a bit more, let's say, physician or caregiver-oriented than maybe might have been optimal. We also know that in this country, until recently, we largely paid for fee-for-service medicine. And I say until recently, frankly, it's uh, still the case. Oh, excuse me. Um, I'm going to get a napkin. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Thanks. You. 
too many, too many airplane flights. <laughs> but I think the, um, the opportunity is to basically take the changing in reimbursement around um, uh, paying for outcomes and the ability to take the orientation around the patient. And this institute was basically created with a, a board of directors, which is quite impressive from across not only federal agencies, but providers, uh, pharmaceutical companies, medical device companies. One of the co-authors with Francis on the paper I mentioned was Rick Kuntz, who's the chief medical officer from Medtronic. And uh, Rick's organization has a medical device-oriented surveillance network called the Global Post-Approval Network, another very brave and innovative effort to collect data from around the world around devices in order to get more insights on how well they're being used by patients. Thank you very much for that. Sometimes, and that's the, we want to make sure that we don't get into this trap of being our own echo chamber, and that's speaking to us, the medical research community, because as Bob had, met, uh, had really reminded us from the get-go, this challenge is so much larger than just a health or a scientific challenge. And so we want to make sure that we always try to set the stage to bring as many stakeholders into the mix as possible. So let me actually pull slide number four, please. Alzheimer's disease will cost up to $215 billion per year. That's the latest study, and that's just direct costs. That was a study that was done by RAND and published in the New England Journal of Medicine only a couple of months ago. But, you know, I've also seen that according to the World Alzheimer's Report of 2010, globally, the estimated cost of dementia is more than $600 billion. And I know over the past couple of days, we have heard so much about numbers and dollars and cents. So to put that in perspective, if dementia care were a country, it would actually have the world's 18th largest economy. That's in between Turkey and Indonesia. And if dementia care were a company, it would be the lo world's largest by annual revenue. So it would be invited to the global conference and certainly asked to provide some perspectives. So George, I'm gonna segue that over and see, you know, how do we even grapple with this? We've heard a lot of, of rays of hope as our panelists have been talking about potential solutions, but how do we build a framework? Where do we start? Uh, let me just make a point about this. Um, this obviously is now one of the key drivers of sovereign debt quality. Uh, because of the global health care costs of aging populations, which are largely in least developed countries and in developing countries borne by governments, uh, this is drivers of debt and deficits. So this is a fiscal problem, not just a health problem. And the, uh, you referenced the World Alzheimer's Report, which uh, spoke about 600 billion a year. That's 1% of global GDP. So we're talking about now sort of uh, uh, something that's an economic drag uh, on the world. Uh, but look, let's go back to the 1950, uh, when they, in fact, were estimating that polio health care costs uh, were going to exceed uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in, by the year 2000, uh, and that it was going to swamp every uh, hospital bed, uh, that, in fact, we were going to have essentially uh, iron lung hospitals, and there were pictures of iron lung hospitals that we are going to have to create uh, as a consequence of that disease. And, you know, we don't talk a lot about polio health care costs today. Uh, so how did we deal with that issue? It was innovation. It was new medicines. It was the efforts of the Sanofis and the NIHs that actually got us to a place where those health care costs were de minimis. So that is where I would suggest we have to go generally. But let me uh, come back, because uh, finally, I think, if this is a disease that's 100 years old, uh, 1906, right? discovered by Alois Alzheimer's. Uh, this is a disease that began to get professional attention at the NIH in 1979, about the same time as HIV AIDS. Now look at the difference in progress between those courses of polio, HIV AIDS, and, and Alzheimer's. It's extraordinary. So from a patient perspective, this isn't working. <laughs> Business as usual ain't working, folks, because we have people dying at the rate of perhaps a half million a year, death certificates uh, being a wholly inadequate explanation for the number of people dying and suffering from this disease. So there, this is a systems problem for which we're probably going to need combination therapies in a sense. You know, we're going to need multiple approaches 
uh, and a number of people on this panel have signed up as industry leaders to basically go at this problem as a combination therapy issue. But let me just identify four areas where patients are really do not think this system is responding to them. Resources. Right now, NIH allocates about 450. I know that's not, uh, that's not adjusted for the sequester, Francis, and not adjusted by the fact that Francis has exercised what little discretion he has over his budget to over-allocate to Alzheimer's. So thank you for that. Um, but right now, uh, we spend about $6 billion a year, roughly, uh, sequester adjusted down, uh, for cancer. You know, four or five uh, billion dollars a year for cardiovascular and stroke, three billion dollars for HIV AIDS, all pre-sequester numbers, uh, and about 450 million for Alzheimer's. That pattern of investment was basically decided politically. It, we ended up investing by disease in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, then we decided as a country, as a matter of policy, to invest in NIH. But we are simply frozen in that pattern of investments politically, uh, and for a variety of reasons, it's difficult for that pattern of investments to change. So somehow, we need more resource uh, devoted to this disease to get more targets, uh, to get more shots on goal, or I guess, more goals at which to shoot, <laughs> uh, uh, so that we, in fact, can uh, move more quickly. That resource has to be well applied. Um, the second area is that the academic research and indeed to some extent the industry uh, drug development efforts aren't patient-centric. And I, why do I say that? Academic researchers tend to want to go get published. Uh, and then because more publications means more likelihood of getting grants and more likelihood that they will gain standing in their community. Well, the time between the actual discovery in the lab and the actual publication of that data is usually a year. There's peer review, but there are other ways to do peer review. So if, imagine if something happened today and you didn't get the news for a year. That would be totally intolerable in today's world where Twitter tells you basically what's happened anywhere in the world instantaneously. So that academic establishment right now is responding more to publications and grants than it is to the patient who wants speed, speed. So why not peer review on the net rather than peer review through journals? A little revolutionary, but in fact, why can't we do faster peer reviews? Second, industry, by the nature of the incentives that we've created for industry, has to build to patent life. Well, if you have 17 or 20 years of patent life on a, 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 the next drug up uh, from something in a reasonably well-established field, uh, you've got 20 years uh, of, of opportunity. If, in fact, you're working in, in Alzheimer's and you have uh, 12 years 13 years, 14 years, simply to understand the basic science, uh, to get some shots on that, to go through the entire process of getting a drug uh, to the FDA, let alone reimbursed, uh, you've got little patent life left. So the incentives that we have created for industry are not necessarily aligned with patients. They're aligned with patent life, which you sort of understand, but in fact, hey, is there a way to adjust through tolling or other mechanisms to make it a little more uh, a little more eccentric uh, to, to, to patients. Um, third, um, the regulatory uh, and reimbursement system is not friendly to this, uh, to, 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 to new medicines uh, in this field. And that's notwithstanding the fact that the FDA is leaning forward to reflect the current science in terms of setting more appropriate endpoints for what we know about the science. Uh, but the time to market in this field is extraordinarily long. That means venture capital basically does not like this field. We get fewer startup companies in this space because of the time, cost, and risk to get to market. So this system right now, uh, for all the goodwill of every player in it, uh, basically is uh, aligned against speed to market, speed to patients which is obviously my concern. And then we have no long-term care policy in this country whatsoever. Everyone expects Medicare to basically provide a home health care worker uh, when, when they are unable to take care of themselves and their activi activities of daily living. Not true. Uh, the reimbursement system doesn't even provide a care planning reimbursement for doctors who ought to be there to provide some assistance to someone who's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Right now, they basically say, uh, you know, I'll give you this symptom-modifying drug which may or may not work in you and go home because I have nothing else to tell you. Well, they have a lot to tell 
uh, the patient and the family that's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. We don't even reimburse them for having an intelligent conversation with that family. So there's a whole variety of system defects here, but simply means that boy, just think of what we could do if we began successfully to address uh, in a combination therapy all of those problems with the system. I do think that we are gonna get to a place like polio in some number of years uh, where we're gonna look back on these estimates and say, wasn't that crazy, but let's applaud the companies that got new medicines and new diagnostics to market that enabled us to stop this. But for the patients out there who are dying so rapidly and are suffering so much in terms of the family impact, there's my mother-in-law died with this disease, uh, it can't come fast enough. We've gotta build speed. So the one other thing I would say in addition to speed is openness. I think we need more eyes on, on goal. And, I, and what, what Neil just described as the, the brave new world of open data is, I think, a wonderful opportunity to sort of give a little shock to the system. Because if we can begin to monitor our own brain health, treat it just like a checkup from the neck down, we need a checkup from the neck up, make it common, make it monitorable, we can do wonders with this. But we need new players and new ways of approaching this whole issue of brain health as well as the diagnostics and treatments for these diseases. And I think outside players are gonna be very useful and these dramatic changes in big data I think are gonna be a very useful shock to the system. Thank you for that, George. So what we've heard so far is that really it just, it takes too long and it costs too much to get from, from scientific breakthroughs into the marketplace. And as you've heard, a lot of, of positive reinforcement here on programs that are in the works, but it's still a, a ways towards the end goal. So what, who's in charge of really moving this ball forward? I'm gonna put this out to our panelists here. Who's in charge of making sure that my four and seven year old won't be buying diapers for me in about 50 years? And how do we make sure that this doesn't happen to us? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I would say, it's, unfortunately, to George's point, there's no, there hasn't been a sy system-wide approach. I mean, certainly the government is trying to um, you know, drive the initiative forward with some of the uh, activities such as the, the brain mapping, but that's why you have groups that have been formed, like the um, CEO Initiative on Alzheimer's Disease, which you know I serve as a board member, others serve as a board member, George is the chair, because we need to bring together all the different sectors to try to solve this problem. I mean, uh, you know, we're, I'm not too proud, our company's not too proud to say we, we can't solve this on our own and our industry cannot solve it on our own. So we have to bring together government, you know, so public and private uh, and create a safe harbor for all of those groups to try to solve this problem. And I do believe with some of the conversations that we've had at the CEO, uh, CEO initiative on Alzheimer's that we are coming up with real actionable items, work streams to try to reduce the amount of time for, you know, from research to, uh, to market, to bring together all the different technologies to try to find a biomarker, a surrogate marker, to create flexible trials so that you can put those biomarkers and surrogate markers into those trials, um, even if they're, they're underway. Uh, but it's going to take everyone coming, coming together because as George said, it's a system-wide issue. And the one point that I, I would just make, um, you know, Bob mentioned this is a global issue, and I think a lot of progress is being made in countries like China and you know, India and you know, certainly in uh, other parts of the, the developed world because they, their policies there are a little bit easier, make it a little bit easier for public and private to work together. And here in the U.S., it's, it's difficult for public and private to work together. If you have a not-for-profit that's doing too much activity with a for-profit company or being invested by too much from a profit company, does it change their status from not-for-profit, which changes a lot of the advantages of that you know, group coming together? We have to loosen those regulations to allow more of a free flow from academia to public to you know, academia to not-for-profit, not-for-profit to public in order to solve this, this problem. Sue, did you want to chime in? Yeah, you know, it's incumbent on all of us. The government has started, but I think that that raising of awareness brings a tremendous amount of opportunity for people to come together. And 
I don't think it's only the multinationals. I, George mentioned this about the startup community and the innovation that goes there and how because of the regulations, the murkiness of it at times or the difficulty of them at times and the reimbursement scenarios right now, that community is very, very challenged. I was a venture capitalist before coming to GE and I can tell you that one of my personal passages was, was this whole area of personalized medicine and precision medicine and therefore looking for biomarkers that were blood-based biomarkers so that we could have a test for Alzheimer's as an example. Very, very difficult, first of all, to find that, but there was a lot of potential possibilities. But as we looked at the time horizon to actually invest in something like that, particularly as the reimbursement has changed, it makes it very, very challenging. And you see a tremendous amount of the venture capital community, in fact, saying, I will not invest in personalized medicine as it relates to blood-based diagnostics at this particular time. So that's a gaping hole now that we have to figure out how to bring together. And it's only through these collaborative efforts, all the way through from the disease advocacy groups to, which are the nonprofits, to the venture capital community being allowed to come back into this with some type of stimulus, if you'd like. Mm -hmm. And in addition to that, putting the open innovation um, structures in place to actually get access to the data. I'll use an example, and you'll see us do this over and over again with a number of the brain diseases. We recently partnered with the NFL, which, as you know, because of tra a traumatic brain injury, has become just remarkably challenging. And so we said, how do we start to figure out truly what TBI is? And we put together a $60 million partnership between the NFL and GE and Under Armour which has a number of different segments. One is an open innovation challenge where the data is open to everybody as it relates to what is found in these challenges. In addition to that, we've put together a real study to start to put in place product development around a specific brain scanner that will look at what are the characteristics of TBI. Now, we've all heard that TBI can cause a number of neurodegenerative diseases. It has been studied, but it hasn't been studied enough. So again, bringing together everything from the sports industry to the world of diagnostics, to the world of the therapeutics, to the world of information, to the disease advocacy groups and government, we have to have these forums. And I think the public outcry is going to become very, very large. Thank you for that. So I'm hearing that collaboration is really the, the linchpin here and that as much as no one is exempt from the disease, no one's also exempt from being part of the solution. So George and then Neil. Well, there is good news here. I mean, obviously we now have a National Alzheimer's Action Plan. Uh, it was announced last May. Uh, it has a goal of preventing and treating this disease by 2025. There was an explicit invitation in that plan for industry to step up and join with that. So the CEO initiative on Alzheimer's disease that, uh, uh, that Ann mentioned is in fact industry's response to that. Uh, so these large-scale collaborative efforts are beginning to happen. From a patient's point of view, it's not happening fast enough, but in fact there is at least a seeming willingness to do this. Having said that, we need more fuel in the tank, and I'll come back to the resource issue. I mean, it, it simply is not going to be the case that you can put as much fuel in this tank as you can. It's a small gas tank. We, or, or, uh, it's a large gas tank, <coughs> small fuel. For it. But uh, we just uh, need uh, more resource to it, and we need a more urgency. So the president announced a brain initiative. Terrific, long-term, long-term potential technology and tool development effort. He mentions Alzheimer's in the State of the Union. He mentions Alzheimer's. But has he put a stake in the ground on the 2025 as he should? I think not. Uh, even though it's his plan and it's his goal of 2025, he could declare this. He could put some more fuel in this tank. He has proposed $100 million more for Alzheimer's in next year's budget. It's terrific, 80 million of that for research. That's great. That takes Alzheimer's from a pre-sequester pre number of 450 to 530 against a cancer number of 6 billion. We're now 40% more costly to this society as a disease than cancer. We're more costly to this society uh, than heart disease. 
by what standard ought we to decide which disease states or conditions or therapeutic areas to invest in? Is it cost to society? Is it the number of people affected? Or is it historic construction based upon the fact that we did declare war on cancer 40 years ago, and through the accretion of time, that number has gone from a low number in cancer research to six billion. Cardiovascular disease and stroke got a good deal of attention in the 80s, as did HIV AIDS. Those numbers have accreted. That's fine. We're not talking about taking anything away from any other disease state. But how is it that society has decided uh, that the most costly disease, one that affects millions and millions of people, is not getting the adequate resource? And the estimate, and I say it's a rough estimate of scientists in the field, says that $2 billion a year is pretty much the minimum of what we need. The notion of proposing that to Congress now is almost laughable, right? Because we can't set priorities in Congress very effectively. Neil, I real quick, and I wanted to get Bob's perspective as well. I think George's point about 530 million versus 6 billion is uh, a very evocative point. Another thing, though, that occurs to me as you think about that discrepancy is to look at how some of that 6 billion or the many billions over the years in cancer have been spent. And do we have the opportunity to look at models where we haven't necessarily have an agglomeration of all the many interested and useful parties that could attack Alzheimer's, but groups of people who've worked together in innovative ways? So one example from the cancer community is the WIN Consortium. WIN Consortium was started by MD Anderson uh, and by Institute Gustave Rossi in Paris. It's a leading group for cancer institutions, 28 cancer institutions around the world, where they themselves are looking how to advance the real world, as they call it, clinical trials and investigations into cancer care. Uh, GE is a member of the consortium, Oracle is a member of the consortium. And basically, it's a way to take not, of course, the entire cancer community, and it complements many other cancer activities around the world, but to create, at least in that case, a global network, because as Ann mentioned, and of course, uh, Rob did, this is a global issue, and get some of the leading people together with dedicated funding, with the participation and innovation around things we're doing around data science, things GE is doing around diagnostics and other areas in their cancer business and understand how we can move the ball forward without necessarily waiting for a long-term plan or funding that may never arrive. Bob, I wanted to also get your perspective on this, but if you can, if I can ask you to put both your Department of State hat on as well as your Wall Street hat on, it would be very interesting to hear. Thanks. I'd like to address uh, two issues that I think have come up and have been uh, focused on quite appropriately. And let me talk first about the resource issue and then the globalization issue. I think what is increasingly apparent, the number that was used was Alzheimer's disease will cost up to $215 billion a year. This is for the United States, $600 billion globally. When you look at the actual costs, let's just take for the United States, it is multiples of that. Um, and it's multiples of that because that is the direct cost. If you add the indirect costs of people who cannot work because they have to be caregivers and want to be caregivers, if you look at the people who could have been, as I mentioned earlier, productive members of the workforce but are not now because of Alzheimer's, if you look at the number of people who, even if they weren't in the workforce, would be productive members of society doing other things, the, the impact on the economy, I would say, is probably two or three times that $215 billion. I would also go to the point, and here, here's the question of how we allocate resources that George talked about earlier. In, in my judgment, if you look at the growth rate in uh, Alzheimer's disease and, and the number of people diagnosed with, and the number of people who can no longer be productive uh, participants in the economy, it is, in my judgment, very difficult to imagine that we could solve either the overall medical, Medicare cost problem, if, if you project those numbers out, or the Social Security. Now, the Social Security may be a little bit of a stretch for some people, but let me explain that. The Medicare thing is quite obvious. If you get more and more people who are, are debilitated by this or in the hospitals and need care, Medicare, and to a degree Medicaid, depending on where they are in the spectrum, those costs are going to go up. It's just built in to the demographics of this disease and, and the aging population. Social Security, 
um, is probably not as well understood, but the fact is people who are productive participants in the workforce are paying money into the Social Security system. People who are not, are not. So it affects the whole question of entitlements. It's going to be very difficult to have really substantial entitlement reform in terms of the cost structure. There are a lot of other things that can be done. But the cost structure is going to be very hard to deal with if we cannot deal with this disease. So when we start determining how much money to allocate or reassessing it, we ought to build in the fact that if we do not do more, these costs are going to increase dramatically. If we do more, the savings for some of these programs that everyone realizes are not financially sustainable, the savings from this cure or significant improvements would be multiples of, of the amount of money that, are, that, is already, that goes into, from a government point of view, into these programs. The second is the global thing, and this I'll sort of turn partly to my State Department hat and then the, my Goldman Sachs hat earlier on. <laughs> um, more and more, there's a wonderful study by the Royal Society in Britain about how research is done today compared to the way it was done 20 years ago. And it demonstrates that more and more scientific papers today on medicine, on virtually everything, are done internationally. They're not done by one company. One good companies obviously turn out very good research, but they're done in a collaborative way. And more and more, as you see the Chinese and the Indians and others putting more and more money, they're going to be doing very cutting edge research. So the globalization of the globalization of, of, of data collection, the globalization of um, clinical trials, the globalization of exchange of information done in the labs all around the world will give us another multiplier effect here because a lot of this can be done quite effectively. AIDS, we, we, we forget the fact that a lot of the advancement we had on AIDS was done through collaboration between American scientists and Haitian scientists early on. People tend to forget that there, there's a lot going on. It seems to me that's very important. And then the, from, from my earlier point of view at Goldman Sachs, I think we do have to find, I do think there the lack of venture capital money or early stage angel investing, the kind of stuff that goes into things with quick returns. And don't forget, most of these people who are in this business, George and I have been in this business before, a lot of these people do want relatively quick returns. We have to find some ways of incentivizing the kind of money, private sector and money to go in there uh, and anticipating things with, there, there are various ways of doing this. There are various techniques. If you look at Gavi, if you look at a number of these programs that are, that are, are focused on giving companies that otherwise, or investors that might otherwise only invest for short-term results, and you have some of these long-term incentivization things. Gavi has a very elaborate thing which we worked on at Goldman Sachs to enable them to raise 20-year money for uh, developing uh, new kinds of preventative uh, infection, anti-infectious disease uh, types of things, antivirals in particular. If you look at this and try to do some similar financial structure that can enable more money to go in from the private sector, incentivized by various types of backup financing, you can get a lot more money for this. But it's going to take a lot more money, people being aware of why a lot more money is needed, a lot more global collaboration to get a higher multiplier effect, and some incentives in the market. Now, I want to linger on the point about incentives there, and really incentive, building this, this environment that allows more money to come in despite the fact that ROI is going to be really tough to measure. You have to have that long-term view, but it's such a global crisis that you, you cannot not invest in it, and the numbers are staring at us in the face. And when you think really quickly at the BRAIN initiative that had been um, alluded to earlier, that stands for um, Brain Research to Advance Innovation, innovative neuro, Innovation in Neurosciences, initiative it, that was launched by the White House a couple of weeks ago. It's a hundred million dollars to, it's, it's seed capital if you will, but what it is is it's a starting point and I believe from the way that that initiative is structured, I'm looking at Dr. Collins here, from the, the way that's structured it's really calling on industry and philanthropy and foundations uh, to have this really cross sector of stakeholders to put put a stake on the ground that they're going to be part of the solution, not just from the advocacy perspective or from the science side, but really from the resources point of view. So a quick thing on that, that, Bob. On the financing end, are people paying attention to this? 
Um, in, you mean the financial markets? The financial markets. I would say not to a very significant degree at all, really. And what not. do we need to do? Well, to I think sure. there are, as I mentioned, I used the Gavi example because you weren't getting money into that. The reason we had that, I won't go into the details, but it was essentially it's a way of using debt financing mm -hmm. with various kinds of incentives to get a lot more money into mostly antivirals. But it's, but it, but it, and we tried to do the same thing for AIDS, but we haven't been able quite to, to, to do it in that way. But for, for a number of technical reasons. But there are, there are various ways of utilizing the financial markets to create incentives for putting long-term money, which is what you're gonna need here for all the reasons we mentioned, in a way which does keep peop give people enough of a return so that they will, they will go along. In some cases, it might be government-backed. In some cases, it, it may be a number of financial uh, institutions getting together to, to sponsor it and recognizing they're not going to make any money, they're not going to lose any money, they're going to break even, but they want to do it because of the necessity of doing it. There, there are no shortage of creative people in the financial markets. It's a question of do they use their creativity <laughs> to make a lot of money trading paper um, with one another <laughs> known as prop trading, or do they use some of this creativity also to, to develop financial techniques to move more and more money into this, into the research. Companies, certain big companies can finance themselves to a degree and do take, as you know, a, a certain portion and use it for long-term things that won't have a quick return. But if we're going to get large sums of money for the research stuff, that sort of early stage research, I think there are techniques that have been used for other things that might be usable for this. It's a matter of getting some creative people to them so I'll speak uh, as well to, to the innovative financing mechanisms and to globalization because I do think uh, a global funding mechanism is something uh, right. we very definitely need to, to right. look at seriously, uh, which obviously um, uh, needs to have a certain neutrality in terms of its political alignment. Right. Uh, and in terms, uh, I would suggest it has to be patient oriented so it doesn't look like it's company oriented or researcher, the fr your, your favorite researchers. Uh, but I would suggest that that is a key area. Yeah. Another is a state And the Chinese finance. would may even participate well, in this. Uh, 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 the, this uh, Dr. Collins has made this point in another context. And he basically said it is inevitable uh, that a United States share of basic science funding is going to decline, simply because other nations of the world are, for the <coughs> first time, have enough economic yeah. wherewithal to put money into basic science research. Uh, China being the most obvious, but India as well, and other countries are beginning to put more in. So. Uh, as we look at the aggregate amount of resource uh, being invested in the world in basic science, it could very well be uh, that we will see an increase. But having said that, it, he also made the point that it's vital uh, for uh, patients in America or companies that are U.S. based to make sure that there's not mercantilism going on in the way that countries use their basic science enterprise to favor domestic uh, either medicine uh, innovators or domestic patients. China favoring uh, medicines whose clinical trials start in China, for example, yeah. which right. we're seeing. So the, I think the aggregate resource is not going to necessarily come from the United States. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Neil made an excellent point about making a more effective and innovative use of the existing resources in ways that draws new players in and moves the institution faster. On the global scale, one of the things that the CEO initiative is pressing is a global action plan on Alzheimer's. There is an enormous interest in the OECD, in APAC, uh, WHO has declared this a global health priority, uh, and potentially uh, to get to the treasury ministers and the finance ministers, Bob, where we need your help to figure out a path in to begin to get the globe to pay attention to the kinds of economic drags uh, and uh, sovereign debt risks created by this disease to get Treasury and finance officials into thinking about mm -hmm. this issue as a global economic growth issue yeah. and, as a, and as a sovereign debt mitigator. Um, one, yeah. so, so I do think that uh, as we begin to work on the global stage with a global action plan that CEOI is coming up with, we need to think through how to reach different players uh, even in the government levels and get the kind of thinking you're displaying into the global conversation. I think if we make a good, strong analysis that they have an interest in <coughs> to head off worse debt accumulation and entitlements costs 
and, and improve and turn the curve around, bend the curve back to more sustainability. This is a central element of that, and they ought to put more money in now to get those better dividends later. And, and I, just one quick thought. I totally agree on this notion of innovation nationalism on the part of some countries. India has some of this to a degree, China, some others, where they narrow down the number of companies who are able to participate in government-funded innovation or to sell uh, the, the benefits of their innovation within the country. In other words, they discriminate against foreign innovation in favor of their own innovation. All the drug companies suffer from this to a degree in India, China, and elsewhere. So that, that actually impedes progress because it segments the innovation market when it, where it should be more collaborative. And that's another thing. And the, G, the G8, we're working on this. The WTO, we're working on this. The WHO. And, and APEC, where we really actually have quite a substantial initiative with the Asians. So let me get the perspectives of Sue, Neil, and Ann here as heads of global companies. Mm -hmm. How are you actually addressing some of these as you're working across countries? So um, one of the things that GE does is very, very actively work with the ministers of health. And every time we've gone to a number of these companies, the emerging countries, in fact, they always bring up the issue of health as being one of their major issues. And they sort of, they rank it as health, energy, and infrastructure. Some countries might even say infrastructure first. We've put together programs that are very much company to country, looking at specifically modules to address some of this. And a lot of it is educational because they don't have the capacity, they've not built the capacity to actually understand how to put, for example, a prevention screening program in place. Even in breast cancer, when it's in this country, you go, well, how is that possible? Well, in a lot of these countries, first of all, there's a stigma, and then second of all, it just doesn't happen. In Alzheimer's, we're starting to try to do the same thing, and, and, and across brain health, in fact, to try to put some capacity building into place with the ministers of health. They're also asking sort of in a change of not having to protect an infrastructure that we have here in this country. Everything is going mobile, as we know. And there, in some of the countries we've spoken to, there is a fundamental belief that, in fact, part of being able to combat these neurodegenerative diseases is to be able to put in place a much better behavioral um, understanding of what's going on early on. Because it doesn't just have to be about a diagnosis that is either blood-based or image-based, et cetera. Mm -hmm. It should be more behaviorally based. Mm -hmm. And they're starting to talk to us a lot about that and figure out how do we, in fact, harness that to start to put that into place, because we don't have anything to protect in some of these countries, as they put it, right? Mm -hmm. Which we do here in the States in terms of our current healthcare system. So those are just, I could go on yeah. for, for quite some time, but I'll let my colleagues actually speak on it. Yeah, I think Sue's right. There is a lot of innovation happening because the environment's different. So for example, in Singapore, I don't know if people are aware, but for two years now, Singapore has had a national electronic health record. Uh, even with Francis's leadership, I don't think we expect that to happen in the United <laughs> States in, uh, in the near future. Uh, and, you know, we, we provided the software and other companies provided a variety of technologies to enable this. So once you have something that in place, albeit for only four million people, uh, you st a lot of opportunities open up. And I think that's when you start having dialogue about how can we take this data and be more proactive in understanding for signs earlier on to diagnose disease and get people into treatment plans earlier than would otherwise be the case. The other thing we haven't talked too much about here is what's happening in, in really the very larger world around the use of data and the use of uh, what's now increasingly called data science. You know, it's a new buzzword about every six months in the IT industry, and that's one of the newer ones. Uh, you know, we as a company have spent literally billions of dollars in acquisitions just in the past few years on the leading companies that do what's called sentiment analysis on the internet, including things from Twitter feeds, from Facebook posts, from LinkedIn entries, from a variety of social networks. And you know, one of the companies that we bought uh, somewhat famously was the company that taught, ge told General Motors that they weren't getting much ROI on their Facebook ads and maybe they should stop paying Facebook. <laughs> Unfortunately, that was about two weeks before the Facebook IPO, so it wasn't really appreciated by, uh, by Mark Zuckerberg and friends. But um, these kinds of technologies, which now are really targeted towards retail and uh, behavioral modification in purchasing have enormous potential uh, in looking at how to influence patient behaviors, including when people become more engaged in their health. 
And we've just scratched the surface of understanding how to use the data, you know, research from people like B.J. Fogg, who's you know, been around for years around behavioral modification and patient engagement. I expect now that we've gone through quite a wave of investment in electronic health records and networking, you know, the next buzzword we're going to start hearing around the healthcare community is around patient engagement. And I think we have technologies that are used more broadly in society that we can now start applying to healthcare. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I, I agree with uh, Neil and Sue on the technology piece, and there's, there's countries like China and India, you know, they're in Singapore, as you mentioned, using those. And what we've seen is going in to talk to the ministers of health, just uh, for example, with, with China, I mean, they're, they're very open. They recognize the burden uh, of both cancer as well as Alzheimer's on, on you know, their country and pot potentially holding it back. As you look at, they've had, um, you know, the, the one child law in, in China, and so suddenly they see with the growing you know, population, aging population, that you're going to have these children who are going to have to take care of their parents and their parents' parents and their spouse's you know, parents, and suddenly they're concerned about those individuals and their productivity in the workforce, and will they have to cut back, will they be you know, a burden with stressful you know, uh, um, associated disease like cardiovascular because of, of this? Uh, but what I've been impressed with, um, you know, just uh, specifically with China, is that they, they're quite nimble. You know, we, just for example, we've had conversations with them around the C CEO roundtable on cancer. It only took about six conversations for them to set up an office for the CEO roundtable on cancer to really look at getting a gold standard for their companies there and for the government there. So I think we're going to see them make progress very, you know, rapidly and uh, what we have to open up to in the U.S. is being open to that innovation coming here and partnering with them to, to, to take advantage of that wave that will occur. So I wanted to, before I open it up to a couple of questions, I also wanted to switch here and talk about the, the advocacy front. We talked about the critical importance of patient engagement and for, for those who were with us day one of the global conference and started with Magic Johnson and you know when you look at, we, we had mentioned polio and HIV as examples. So let's take a quick look at those two. Polio, the polio vaccine, you know, it took a, a public outcry like that to get everybody involved in really getting their vaccines. And part of that was we saw the Elvis Presley photo. So you had that moment of, okay, let's rally around and there's something we can do about this. On the HIV AIDS front, you had the Magic Johnson moment. So what is our moment for, for for Alzheimer's disease, I mean, we've seen President Reagan. It's not for the lack of celebrity. Why isn't there this public health outcry? What do we need to do to, to make that happen? What kind of environment do we have to, to seed? Um, well, I, obviously we had some two of the 20th century's most visible celebrities, Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, uh, die of this disease and, uh, and yet Mrs. Reagan basically trying to protect his legacy, uh, but did not pay a lot of attention, uh, has not been very visible or vocal about this disease, supportive, but not vocal. Um, Margaret Thatcher, you know, the movie about her that showed her early decline was criticized for showing that in public. So uh, while some people would say, gee, why wasn't Magic Johnson criticized for coming? It was a completely different uh, frame here, and it's, it, it is very strange. I think there's still something about the brain, uh, something about losing one's mind that causes people to pull back in a fear, ignorance, and or fear that they will be questioned on what they did during the, you know, right now people laugh at uh, sort of uh, Margaret Thatcher, the wicked witch is dead, and in fact maybe she had Alzheimer's while she was in office. Same kind of comment about Reagan. So you start exposing yourself to this and you get everything that you've done for the last 10 years of your life questioned in terms of what you've done. So uh, the families tend to suck their loved one into private. And then the caregivers themselves get sucked out of their own social world because they have to take care of it. And so there is not the same context here for patient engagement. And the other side of this is to really get patients engaged so that they have something to do. Uh, and I do think that that's one of our challenges with the CEO initiative is to say, okay, this is what you can do. 
There is a value of knowing about your disease. There are things that you can do to reduce your risk, even though it won't stop the disease, to reduce your risk in terms of diet and exercise. Uh, there are things that you can do in, in effort in honor of your loved one uh, to uh, participate in clinical trials. We have to make that whole experience a lot easier for people, a lot less scary for people, so that we can get engaged, to, to, to Neil's phrase is absolutely right, patient engagement. It's not advocacy, it's not education, it's not that. It's engaging uh, the patients in doing, uh, and their families, in, in, in doing something positive to give hope to the disease. Well, let me open the, cha the for questions. There are a couple of microphones in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. And please introduce yourself. It's a little bright up here. My name is um, Peggy Wallace. I'm with Golden Seeds, which is an investment firm that invests in women-owned and women-led companies. We have invested in a company called Cognition Therapeutics, founded by Dr. Susan Catalano. Have any of you heard of it up there? It's a cure for prevention of modification of Alzheimer's. We are an angel group. Our money has allowed her to reverse the, d the disease in transgenic mice. Your welcome world. I may be an investor in what you just described, it may be the biggest become the biggest company on the planet. We can't take it any further. She has a third way. It is not a beta, it is not plaque. She has reversed the disease. She wants to go into clinical in patients with Alzheimer's. We will have zero competition for patients. Mm -hmm. There is no clinical program on the planet for patients with Alzheimer's. We need risk capital. We can't listen. We don't have time to craft the 20-year programs, blah, blah, blah. We did it. We invested. I have my cards. Anybody who wants to join us and take this to the next stage because the planet needs to know if she's right or not. And if, when she gets ready to publish in Nature, if you're an editor, get that article in there. And Peggy, did you have a specific question for our panelists? I just, I'm announcing that there is, there is, we took, <laughs> I'm announcing sure. that somebody has taken action. We did a, an angel investment, and the company's ready for the next phase. And there are things we can do, and this disease is deadly, and there's a sense of hopelessness and a lack of investment, and venture capital isn't participating, and nobody's participating. Well, then let's connect so you let's with our panelists I here. I want everyone to know Definitely. about it. Golden Seeds, Cognition Therapeutics, Susan Catalano, you must know this. Yes, so Thank I, you. I, I'll just make a comment, let make sure I get your card. That's yeah. uh, <laughs> for sure, for that information. Sometimes it's hard for the big pharma companies to, to find the smaller companies that are doing that, that basic research. And I think, you know, as a big pharmaceutical company, a big uh, healthcare company, I mean, we recognize that we have to open up to innovation externally, and so those collaborations, entering into you know the basic, supporting basic science. So we're we're very open. We just need to find those companies, and sometimes we find them mainly through venture capital and partnerships with them. But if venture capital's not there, it's hard for us to to surface them. So uh, you know, I would say. I agree, we need to be investing in that basic science. We need to know what those ideas are, so bring them forward so we can support. I see a billion dollar deal right here. <laughs> <laughs> you are here for that. <laughs> Next thank question. You very, thank you very much. Michael Miller, Bel Air Investment Advisors. I'd like to first thank the panel for your attention and uh, dedicating a big part of your life to this uh, hugely extraordinary problem. Uh, I came in this morning you know, concerned and I'm leaving frustrated because it seems to me that with everything I read, whether it's proteins, whether it's tangles, there is a path to find a medical cure over a period of time. Uh, in published research, the Alzheimer's Association says that if we could move the needle from $600 million to $2 billion for 10 years, there could be a cure. To me, that seems like a very small amount of money coming from the finance world. And I talk not only as a citizen, but as a concerned husband whose wife has a mother suffering from that and an aunt and another aunt who <coughs> also had that, which means that if my wife has a 50% likelihood of having that gene, then she will have a one-third chance of also suffering the horrors of this disease. But also as a father, which means that my daughter will similarly suffer the same things that you're concerned about suffering. What in the world can we do, not as financiers, not as business people, not as people looking to make a profit as shareholders and companies that are going to make a profit, but as concerned human beings. 
Thank you, Michael. And I'm going to use that as our final qu question, actually. Let's go down. You want to start, Sue? Oh, sure. I mean, it, thank you for the question. I, I fundamentally believe that we almost need a national exposure campaign. And what do I mean by that? When you think about what the Ad Council has done as it relates to seat belts and eradication and decreasing the, the number of people that die there, when you think about just say no on drugs, when you think about the silent disease of heart disease and having been able to decrease that, how did that come to be? And part of it is using the media that we've got to make people very, very aware. And I, I fundamentally believe that by doing much more of that and getting a campaign and exposure associated to this and really educating folks from the time we're very young, not when it's too late, right? And starting to make people aware of this, I think there's just a public outcry that happens and then attention gets brought to it. You're right, there is a lot of public um, partnership, if you'd like, with private uh, companies and whatnot, and there's government initiatives but we're nowhere close to that $2 billion spend per year. And so only through this incredible exposure campaign do I fundamentally believe it can truly change it. And we've got to start, just like we did with some of the other sort of um, scourges of, of, of diseases. So let's take that one. I know we are Hello? out of time, so go ahead. Can I just put one more thing into the sure. ring? Everyone here seems to be talking about the enormous amount of money that needs to be spent, but there is the possibility that you could spend a lot less if the focus was better. Uh, the reason I'm saying that is that uh, there's a lot of research. There are biomarkers uh, with uh, PET scanners, as you've mentioned. Uh, there are drugs in train which potentially could cure Alzheimer's. And the previous gentleman said it could take 10 years, but actually it could even take five if the process could be ex expedited and focused. Um, there mm -hmm. are, uh, I'm in the industry, so I'm involved in a trial which will produce results at the end of this year, beginning of next year, uh, and uh, those results look promising. The problem is uh, everyone seems to have an interest in building up the pie without a system to try to prioritise and get things happening uh, in a more cost-effective way. Absolutely, and I think we've heard that through power, through collaboration, a series of multi-sector partnerships, more money, definitely resources was a key thing. We, we have to really address your point of, you know, shrinking the timeline and not just, not just addressing it from, from the edges. So I want to go down the, take this opportunity to give you guys a chance to really talk about the to-do. What can we give our, our audience members here and those who will be viewing this online, what is there to do? Let's start with actually, let me go with Bob here. Well, I just really want quick. to go back to the er earlier point on the resources. I'm sure targeting is, is critically important, but we still need a lot of resources because the, the law of probabilities works in this area sure. as, as in others. If you put more resources in with really good researchers, you will find a higher probability, not a certainly a higher probability of getting results. And I would just make one point. We're going to be in the midst in this country uh, of an enormous debate over the next several years of how do we bring the cost of entitlement programs under control. I would say that if we do not have, as a major part of that debate, the goal of reducing dramatically uh, the incidence of Alzheimer's through cures or prevention or ways of maintaining that disease. That disease. It's like talking about the, the history of Noah without mentioning the flood. I mean, th this is a critical part of this debate. And if we don't, this is the time to inject it in the public policy debate because you're not going to be able to deal with these long-term entitlements programs unless you address this. If you do address this and have people understand it, and how it fits into that debate, it gives you a platform for addressing this at a high political level, not, not only here, but China will have an even worse problem because they're aging more rapidly than we are. So every country ought to do this and it ought to be a central part of the debate over how to, con how to control um, and reduce the rate of growth of entitlement programs. Neil, really briefly, and Sure, I just would certainly I'd love to see the kind of global and Madison Avenue enhanced approach that, uh, that Sue mentioned. But I think even in our own companies, I mean, we're not as large as GE. We only have about 120,000 employees, but the average age is 44. 
people at that age of a sandwich generation are dealing with both, of course, in many cases, child care as well as elder care. Uh, the kind of patient engagement programs that I mentioned that I think are going to be important across the industry, across multiple diseases, are also starting to be deployed in the uh, corporate environment. I think many of us work in large organizations. I think we could actually start in having a significant impact by doing it within those organizations as well. Fantastic. Anne? Yeah, well, I will continue to uh, harp on the basic science research that needs to be done and supporting that research, investing there. I'm advocating that for certainly for our company. And then I'll just make one other point. It's not just about the, the uh, pharmaceutical treatment or the, the, the basic science. We also have an opportunity now to improve the care for these patients, whether that's through mm -hmm. services provided, you know, offsets for caregivers, you know, solutions support. And that's innovation that can occur very quickly. You know, we should be investing uh, there. There is effort. We need to make effort with payers to reimburse for that. And so basic science, innovation today for caregivers, and let's influence the payers to reimburse for it, even without a biomarker. Fantastic. So I'm going to be very fast. Uh, unbelievably, senators and congressmen and women in, in Washington say they don't hear from their constituents about this. It's striking. Um, so I'm going to suggest you go to usagainstalzheimers.org and join. And every week, you will get an action item that you can do that gets sent to some congressman or woman or senator or somebody in industry to do something different than what they've been doing. So I would encourage you to do that. Every woman in this audience ought to go to this website, womenagainstalzheimers.org and sign up for that because the power of women's voice, two-thirds the victims, two-thirds the caregivers, could be enormously influential very quickly if we can mobilize women as we are doing. There's an African-American network against Alzheimer's, two times more likely than whites to get the disease. Any African-American in this audience, sign up for that. Let your voice be heard. And be willing to talk about this disease if it's in your family because that's the, 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 the the stigma associated with this disease causes people to pull in, don't. Use that pain, turn it out to get engaged. So that's what I Well, let, please join me in thanking this excellent panel this morning. And let's turn that frustration into action at this point. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I